Welcome back to Epic Tales Time. Today, we're going to discuss a highly controversial topic that has gained momentum and become one of the most dangerous criminal organizations in the USA. Their activities include drug trafficking, extortion, murder, and many other serious crimes. This video was supposed to come out a while ago, but I became lazy. So, let's not waste any more time, let's get into the topic. The Beginning and Creation of the Organization Several people think that the Mexican Mafia organization comes from a Mexican country, but that is not true. The Mexican Mafia is a gang that began in the United States and continues to operate in the US. The Mexican Mafia was formed in 1957 by 13 Hispanic street gang members from different Los Angeles neighborhoods who were incarcerated at the Dual Vocational Institution, a California Youth Authority facility, which is now an adult state prison in Tracy, California. The founding members formed the gang order to protect Hispanic inmates from other prison gangs. One of the founders of Laim is Luis Wero Buff Flores, who was an active member of the Vario Hawaiian Gardens Gang in Hawaiian Gardens, California. Gang warfare between Hispanic neighborhoods was the norm during the 1950s and 60s, so the fact that Luis Flores was able to get established enemies to set aside their rivalries upon entry into the prison system was something that was not thought possible. Luis Flores initially recruited violent members to the gang in an attempt to create a highly feared organization which could control the black market activities of the dual prison facilities. LAI member Ramon Mundo Mendoza claims that in the beginning the overall goal was to terrorize the prison system and enjoy prison comforts while doing time. It is said that the name Mexican Mafia was to show organizations similar to the American Mafia but it was later changed to not be confused with it. Furthermore, the Black Hand symbol was a reference to the Black Hand of the early 20th century. The Rise of Mexican Mafia by 1961, violence got so bad at the dual vocational institution that administrators transferred a number of the Charter Law E members to San Quentin Penitentiary in the hopes of discouraging their violent behavior. This tactic failed. Cheyenne Cadena arrived on the lower yard of San Quentin and was met by a 6'5", 300-pound black inmate who kissed him. Cadena returned a short time later, walked up to the unsuspecting predator, and stabbed him to death with a jailhouse knife, or shiv. There were more than a thousand inmates on the yard and no witnesses stepped forward. A string of other slayings soon followed as Mexican Mafia members sought to establish a reputation among the inmates of San Quentin. The Mexican Mafia's quest for complete control alienated many other Mexican-American inmates who were fed up with Mexican Mafia stabbing, killing, and stealing their watches, rings, cigarettes and anything else of value. Some of them secretly founded a new prison gang called Nuestra Familia or Our Family. It was first established in the mid-1960s at the California Correctional Training Facility in Soledad. Some of the early members were from the Los Angeles area, but NF soon drew inmates primarily from rural communities in Northern California. The Mexican Mafia saw Nuestra Familia as inferior and just a bunch of farmers, or farmeros. However, in 1968 at San Quentin, a full-scale riot broke out after a Mexican Mafia soldier, or soldado, stole a pair of shoes from a Nuestra Familia sympathizer. Nineteen inmates were stabbed and one Laim associate ended up dead. The battle became known as the Shoe War, and it established Nuestra Familia as the major Laim rival. The Mexican Mafia gained significant power and control over illegal activities in the California prison system by using violence. The gang also extended its influence outside the prison system when members who were released from custody began taking control of narcotics distribution in parts of Southern California, primarily by taxing drug dealers. New Mexican Mafia Laim should not be confused with the New Mexican Mafia. Around 1974, a group of Hispanic inmates at Arizona State Prison, Florence, formed a prison gang known as the Mexican Mafia. Arizona Department of Corrections officials at that time obtained information that this group patterned themselves after the California Mexican Mafia which had been in existence for several years. Several Hispanics who came into the Arizona prison system brought the concept and philosophy of the California Mexican Mafia. In 1978 the Mexican Mafia split into two organizations. One kept the original philosophy and structure and currently refer to themselves as the original Mexican Mafia, Califas Faction, EME. 
The Other, which came into prominence in 1984 and refer to themselves as the New Mexican Mafia. Many assaults and murders of members of both groups have occurred as a result of each organization claiming the title of a Mexican Mafia within the Arizona prison system. They have created their own rules and regulations and have established an organizational structure. Each member is allowed to vote on issues regarding membership and leadership. The leader, approved by the members, has the power to solely decide important issues. Former gang member reveals secrets. The life of a high-level mobster is a staple of books and Hollywood films. But most real-life gang leaders don't tell their stories. The code of silence runs deep, breaking that code can be fatal. That's especially true if the mobster is behind bars. But one former leader of the Mexican Mafia, a violent group formed in California's prisons, did just that. Rene Enriquez, nicknamed Boxer, who once killed for the gang and also ordered the deaths of men and women in prison and on the streets of Los Angeles, ended up opening his life to the police and sharing many of the organization's secrets. When he decided to defect in 2002, Enriquez became the highest-level Mexican Mafia leader to work with the cops. Black Hand of Death In the unlikely event you encountered Enriquez on the street, you'd meet a polite man with a tinge of cockiness, perhaps that of a high-powered business executive or professional athlete. But if you met up with Enriquez, say, on the beach, with his shirt off, you'd have a very different impression. Carved on his body are menacing tattoos that that tell a life story of mayhem and murder. His most prominent tattoo is a black hand on his chest, a symbol of the Mexican Mafia. We call it the black hand of death, he says. Enriquez says he looks like a typical gang member, though he adds he does not believe he is a typical gang member. I believe I'm a cut above the rest. As a mafioso, you have to be an elitist. You have an elitist, arrogant mentality, he says. That's how you carry yourself in the Mexican Mafia. That's how you project yourself. Enriquez has been involved in organized crime for 20 years and was a Mexican Mafia member for over 17 years. Destined to get there. Enriquez is currently behind bars, serving two life sentences for murder. And California prisons are where Enriquez fought his way to the top of the Mexican Mafia, a group that rallies Latino gang members from the southern part of the state. But in 2002, he had a change of heart, Enriquez quit the Mexican Mafia and agreed to cooperate with authorities. He told his story to prison investigators in videotaped interviews. For the first time, we had a Mexican Mafia member defect that was really able to lay out for us how the organization works, the organizational structure, says Robert Marquez, a special agent with the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Enriquez's information was a bonanza. But what really intrigued investigators was his unusual profile. Enriquez grew up in a middle-class home in places like Thousand Oaks and Sunset Hills in California. He showed early promise in school. But instead of following his father into business, Enriquez channeled his ambitions into the local street gang. And once we got into the gangs, we understood that the homeboys that got out of prison were well respected. You go there, and you learn prison, Enriquez says. We wanted to get to prison somehow. And we were destined to get there. While serving time for armed robbery, Enriquez started carrying out assaults for Mexican Mafia leaders in San Quentin and Folsom prisons. The Mafia had deep roots in the California prison system, having been formed there in the 1950s. Enriquez learned the art of making homemade knives and hiding them in his rectum. He carried out assaults for the Mexican Mafia on other inmates. Then, after he was paroled, Enriquez used his connection with Mexican Mafia leaders in prison to extort drug dealers on the streets, where the cocaine and crack trade was booming. A true powerhouse. Perhaps Enriquez's greatest achievement was in helping extend the Mexican Mafia's brand to dozens of LA street gangs. And he did this through an elaborate subterfuge. In the mid-1990s, the group put out calls to stop drive-by shootings among LA Latinos. But Enriquez says the aim wasn't peace. Our true motivation for stopping the drive-bys was to infiltrate the street gangs and place representatives in each gang, representatives which then, in turn, tax illicit activities in the areas, he says. He says the Mexican Mafia wanted to channel the random shootings into a form of violence it could control, for profit. 
and we already had it planned out that California would be carved up, into slices, with each member receiving an organizational turf, he says. The Mexican Mafia's campaign against drive-by shootings had another benefit, good PR they saw that as a way into being more respectable, in the eyes of sympathetic do-gooders, city leaders, church leaders, author Blatchford says. And for the most part, Enriquez says, it worked. Tens of thousands of gang members adhered to what we said. Us. High school dropouts, he says. But we had such authority behind who we were, they listened. It was then, he says, they realized the true potential of the Mexican Mafia, astronomical amounts of money could be made without ever having to touch drugs or do anything again themselves. We could do all this, we could become a true powerhouse, because of the finances generated by taxation, extortion, protection, Enriquez says. Drug profits flowed to prison. Drug dealers on the street sent checks and money orders to gang leaders behind bars, under the noses of California prison staff. Enriquez and his associates socked away tens of thousands of dollars. He invested in bank CDs and government bonds. The accounts were only frozen after he defected. In recent times, the Mexican Mafia has emerged as a menacing force, not only affecting the criminal landscape but also leaving a detrimental mark on the lives of numerous youths. This article delves into the negative influence exerted by the Mexican Mafia on young individuals, exploring how their activities have propagated violence and